Well, good morning. I, when somebody does an introduction like this, there are two prayers that I offer. <laughs> Prayer number one is, Lord, forgive me for enjoying that so much. And prayer number two is, um, Lord, forgive him for lying. Uh, when, when Dave says, I was pastor of one congregation, that's true. Uh, I was pastor of a congregation basically in one location. But over the years, I basically uh, pastored five different congregations. Because each time you move to a different level with the number of people you're dealing with, it, your whole role as a pastor changed. I mean, when you got 35 people showing up on Sunday, you know everybody by name, you connect with everybody probably in any given week. I'm just wondering about this remote. That's an aside, by the way. Um, <laughs> it should be green and it's red. Is there a reason for that? And it keeps going off. Is that a scary thought? We'll, we'll see what happens. Do I have any power to... Con- I'm not going to worry about the remote anyway. Um, Down where I live, they believe that the only movie I've ever seen in my life is Chariots of Fire. (laughs) Now, if you're under 50, you're saying to yourself, Chariots of what? Um, Because in 1981, Chariots of Fire uh, came out and criticized widely by the movie critics but it became the number one movie of 1981. It's a story of a young man who was raised on the mission field in China, and his name is Eric Little. And the core of the story involves two characters, Eric Little, and you'll hear an example of this a little later on, and Harold Abrams. Little representing Scotland as a runner, Abrams representing England. And Eric Little has a a deep desire within him, and it's, it's so, such a big passion that his sister Jenny gets in his face. <clears throat> and I, I agree with Charlie Brown on this, that sisters are the crabgrass in the lawn of life. <laughs> so so uh, uh, Jenny, Jenny gets in Eric's face, and she said, she, she's challenging him to go back to the mission field, give up this foolish running stuff. And there's a powerful statement that Eric Eric makes to her, and it's this. I believe God made me for a purpose, and that purpose is China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Not to run would be to hold him in contempt. And I just want to use that example to say to you, thanks for the privilege you've given me for three weeks of running. Because this is my running experience and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Thanks for the welcome you've given to me. Uh, let me just very quickly... <laughs> and Lord, forgive me for enjoying that. Um, <laughs> l- let me just very quickly go back. We, we have built our three Sundays around that famous scripture in Isaiah chapter 9. And you heard it read this morning, and in each week we've built a New Testament scripture in as well to show how did this kind of thing become evident in the life of Christ. And so this morning we're going to be using John chapter 14, 27. But on the first week I had with you, I talked about the complexity of gift giving. And I used my wife as an example, and last week I couldn't because she's not here, but I can use her again this week because she's not here. I couldn't last week because she was here. Um, But basically what I said was, as a gift giver, my longing is to hear, when I give a gift, to hear somebody say, that's exactly what I need. It just doesn't happen off. But God knew exactly what we needed. And Isaiah had a power, God-empowered moment when he said, for unto you a child is given, unto you a son son is born, unto you a child is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And that's the gift because God knew exactly what we needed. And we did the big overview that God gave us a gift that brings light to our dark places, joy to our saddest times, wholeness to our brokenness, and hope to our despair. He knew exactly what we needed. So last week we progressed a little. And we took two of those four identifications that are in that Isaiah 9 scripture. And we said, this is what we knew, God knew we needed. 
He had, knew we needed a wonderful, amazing counselor to give direction to our emotional and spiritual lives. And he also knew that we need a, an everlasting or eternal father because that's how we get our identity shaped. So much of our identity comes from our earthly fathers. The problem with earthly fathers is they disappoint. They just can't consistently deliver the goods. And if you, you've had a, a negative experience with an earthly dad, it is very difficult to have a reshaped image of what a heavenly father is like. But that's what he knew we needed. So this morning we're take, going to take a little bit of a different journey. We're going to talk about this... Um, Second part, the, the other two parts of this, the need for a strong God and the need for a prince of wholeness, which is the way the message translates that. I don't know if you've ever had a, a circumstance where you, you looked at that circumstance and you said, there is no way there's going to be a good outcome here. I just can't even begin to picture that this is going to end well. And it may have been in a relational situation, it may have been in a work situation, it may have been in your school context. But you looked at a situation and you said, I just don't see that this can possibly end well. Yesterday morning I was asked to meet with two brothers and their wives. It's been a difficult six months for them, and there's been a lot of conflict grow up in the relationship between those two families. And they asked if I would meet with them in order that we could try and resolve some of that and see if, we could get, if they could get to a better place with each other. And I tell you, if there was one thing I didn't want to do yesterday, that I didn't want to do. But I prayed, and this is the prayer that I prayed. Lord, I need just one question to ask these people that will make a difference in moving them to a healing place. And the question which came to mind was this, because I knew they'd all express to me very clearly we don't want to go back over all the junk. We don't want to review all that stuff. We just want to move forward. And the question God gave me was this. If you had it to do all over again, what would you do differently? And I asked that question, and without a moment's hesitation, the one brother jumped in and he said, I would do this. I'm not very patient. And God's having to teach me more patience all the time. And he said, secondly, I am very good at judging people, and I'm not very good at extending grace. And I need to learn more about how to extend grace. And I was, in that moment, I just thought, I'd love to hug this guy, but probably not right now. Because I thought that that was, he was, of all four people sitting in the room along with myself, he was the one who needed to speak first. <clears throat> and I thought, okay, this is going to be an opportunity for the other couple, his brother and his wife, to be able to speak into that. But before they could even open their mouths, before they could even probably gather their thoughts, his wife turned to him and said, and they're not the only ones that experience a lack of grace and impatience. My, I and our kids do as well. And that just took the whole conversation to a whole other level. And I tell you that for this reason. I'm not capable of coming up with those kinds of questions because before we le left that room, all five of us gave everybody else in the room a big hug through the tears that we shared in that moment because it was a powerful healing experience. I'm not capable of doing that. God knew exactly that what I need in my life is a mighty strong God that can do a simple thing like help you shape questions. When you're in a situation and you look at it and I say, I don't think there's any way this is going to work out. And when, we, when he knew our need for a mighty strong God, he knew that that would enable me to stop pretending. If I embrace his gift, the gift of a mighty strong God, I don't have to pretend. You see, because in our world, pretend is what it's all about. The culture builds a world of pretend. And we all are longing for a place at the table. But the only way we get a place at the table is we have to please and perform. Do you understand that? I have a place at the table as long as I please and perform. But the minute I'm no longer pleasing or performing, I'm now not welcome. 
And Jesus stepped into our world in an amazing way. He said, it's not about pleasing and performing. It's not. But I grew up in, in my early experience. My brother was eight years older than I was. And he was always better at everything. And so I, I had to make a decision. Was I going to try and please and perform at a level greater than my brother? Whether it was athletics, whether it was academics, whether it was obedience to my parents or not. And I made a decision to become a rebel. And in the process of that, I lost my place at the table. And so it became a world in which I, I lived out a different kind of existence. You know this phrase, I, this, this is what happens when you live in a world that demands you please and perform. You get to a place in your life where you say, I'm not who I think I am, I'm not who you think I am, I'm not who, I am who I think you think I am. Did you get that? <laughs> I mean, go to work tomorrow and tell somebody that. Uh, they'll be awestruck. I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. Get that? That's a, what a world of pretend does. It takes to, us to a place where we become actors. As much as you think I'm old because of chariots of fire, think about this. I know a song that says this, and you've got to be 80 to know this song. <laughs> Dance ballerina dia, dance. A thousand people here have come to see the show as round and round you go, so da- ballerina dance. That's the world of pretend. And why the mighty God stepped into my life as a gift to me is so that I could stop pretending. And the second thing it enables me to do is it enables me to start positioning. To start, oh, I better tell, let, give that to you too. Start positioning myself. Perhaps the most significant lesson I've learned in my spiritual life is this. There's absolutely nothing I can do to enhance my spiritual life, to grow my spiritual life, because that's the work of God. The one thing I can do is I can position myself. So 7.30 every Saturday morning, I'm in a room with a bunch of guys, and we got our heads into the Scripture. And every other week, I'm with a group of guys that we have accountability with each other, and we're trying to find out where we are on our journey of, towards a greater level of maturity and wholeness. Why do we do that? It's all part of the positioning. And every Tuesday morning at 7.30, I'm on the Internet with a guy from Florida and a, and a guy from Toronto. Why? Because we're trying to position ourselves. We're doing daily exercises of, spiritual, of a spiritual nature, to try and position ourselves so that God can do in us what only God can do. I know of no place that that's more clearly expressed. When we build our new facility, I wanted the people to be able to do something before the carpet went down in the sanctuary, the auditorium. And I invited them to come, and with permanent markers, they wrote their favorite scripture verse on the floor. So that when I knew when I stood on Sunday morning, I'd be standing on the Word of God. It sounds kind of trite, but isn't it kind of neat? So families would come and they'd write their favorite scripture verse. The verse that I wrote on that floor is characteristic of why I need a mighty strong God. And it's part of the positioning. Every now and again, I need to go back to this verse in order to find myself in a position for God to grow me. And the verse is this. Zephaniah 3.17. Don't let that startle you, because probably some of you didn't even know there was a Zephaniah in the Bible, but here it is. The Lord your God is with you. The Mighty One will save you. He will rejoice over you. You will rest in His love. He will sing and be joyful about you. Isn't that a great verse? Let Let me do it again. It's worth... We may go into overtime here. We did it both other weeks. So, The Lord your God is with you. Here's five things that he says. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you. You will rest in his love. He will sing and be joyful over you. I need that. I need to hear that. I need the mighty God to save me because I get myself in some messy situations. So, it's, it's about positioning. I'm... 
The third thing is, when that mighty God, when I embrace that gift of that mighty God, it helps me to stop apologizing. <clears throat> My wife uh, and I went on a seven-day retreat a few years ago. And we each given individual counselors who met with us for an hour each day, and we did lots of other activities. But the counselor that my wife had uh, gave her this verse. You'd be familiar, many of you be familiar. Psalm 46, verse 10. Anybody know that verse? It's a simple verse. Be still and know that I am God. And he said to Jan, for the next week, I want you to concentrate on this verse. And I want you to build it as deeply into your life as you can. And so the first meeting they had, she said to her counselor, by the way, I need you to know I don't do still. <laughs> and that's true. I mean, she doesn't sit still for a nanosecond. <clears throat> and he said, okay, here, here's what I'd like you to know. Another translation of that verse might be this. Stand at attention and Listen. She said, I think I could do that. Mm, I, I have some questions about that, but that, you know, that was her decision. Because my wife, for all of her life, has been apologizing that she doesn't do still. And it was time to stop that. It was time for a, 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 a guy who cared deeply about her to step into her life and say, Jan, it's not about doing nothing. It's about being attentive to what God wants to do in your life. Stand at attention and listen for him. And it's been, it's been a great experience for her. And she stopped apologizing about encountering God because she thought she had to be still. The fourth thing is this. When I embrace what God knew I needed exactly, the mighty, strong God, it enables me to start acknowledging. Start acknowledging what? Start acknowledging what I said at the beginning of this message when I said, there are many places I... You see, because this is about an outward journey that God puts us on. Last week we talked about the inward journey that helps us get some things resolved, like how do we position us, ourselves well for... Uh, emotional and spiritual, strong, spiritually strong relationships, how do, we, how do we get ourselves a place where we're really clear about who we are, what our, where our identity is truly staked? But when he puts us on the outward journey, he knows that we need a mighty strong God to address some of these issues that keep us from fully engaging in that outward journey. And one of them, the fourth of these, is to start acknowledging. Start acknowledging what? Start acknowledging that he's capable of doing things that I'm not. Years ago, Robert Schuller, who ended life in a tragic way, but had some powerful things to teach people in ministry. Robert Schuller said this, if you think God has given you a great idea and you want to pursue it, you need to ask yourself three questions. And question number one is this will help people who are hurting. Because if the answer to that is no, don't bother. But if you truly believe it will help people who are hurting, then you need to get on it. But the second question you need to ask is this, is anybody else doing it? Because if the answer to that is yes, don't you bother trying to do it, you just team up with them. And I face that all the time when I ride in the police cruiser. Because police officers are telling me all the time, I don't understand, why on every street do we have a different church? Why on every street do we have a, a minister or, or, or a food kitchen? Why can't they get their... I can't say. Why don't they get their stuff together? <laughs> I've learned that police officers only have three nouns and four adjectives, and they use them all the time. <laughs> I got introduced to the police... Oh, that's way off topic. <laughs> I got introduced to a police event this week, and, and the guy decided to be really polite. He said uh, to these young cadets that I'm going to be speaking to, you don't have to worry about using this language with them. 
with him because he's heard it all. <laughs> but it allows me, so the, back to the point of it. <clears throat> it allows, it, the embrace of the mighty strong God allows me to start acknowledging that there are things I'm not capable of. So Schuler said, will it help people hurting? If the answer is yes, move ahead. Is anybody else doing it? If the answer is no, move ahead. Because the third question is this, and this is typical Robert Schuler. He said, is it impossible? And if the answer to that is no, then don't bother. Don't waste your time. But if the answer is yes, then pull, uh, jump into it both feet. Why? Because he said, then if something good happens out of it, you know who has to get the credit. Is that, isn't that a neat question? You know, when I, when I went to a little country church, I couldn't imagine this thing growing. And it would never have grown on the big... When people ask me, how did Lakeshore St. Andrews grow to the size that it was? I said two things, grace of God and mucky muck. And he's responsible for the grace, and I'm trying to take care of the mucky muck. Because if it's impossible, and something good comes of it, God has to get the credit. The strong, mighty God has to get the credit. Well, let, let me move quickly to the second part of this. Because the other part of the, of the outward journey, the inward journey is about being able to embrace the gift of a wonderful counselor. It's about the ability to embrace the gift of an eternal, everlasting Father. The outward journey is being able to embrace the gift of a strong, mighty God. But there's a second part to this. It's being able to embrace the gift of a Prince of Peace, or, as the message translates it, Prince of Wholeness. Here's the scripture again that you heard, but I'm going to give it to you in a couple other translations. Living Bible says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give you isn't fragile like the peace the world gives. Listen to that carefully. So don't be troubled or afraid. And the message translation is this. I'm leaving you well and whole. This, that's my parting gift to you. Peace. I don't leave you the way you used to be. Uh, you're used to being left, feeling abandoned and bereft. So don't be upset. And don't be distraught. I'm telling you, just from where I sit, that's a different kind of peace than I can find anywhere else in the world. He knew that, that was exactly what we needed. And the Prince of Wholeness enables us to do three things. I'm going to cover these very quickly. Stop searching for contentment in all the wrong places. Now, how many of you are old enough to say, I actually saw chariots of fire. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> you may remember this scene. Harold Abrams is driven to defeat Eric Little in a race. And they're in the Olympics, and it's the big race. And as he's preparing, his trainer has him on a training table, and he's prepping him for the race. And in the corner sits Harold, sits Harold Abrams' friend. His name is Aubrey. And as he's lying on the table, Abrams turns to him and he says this, Aubrey, you, Aubrey, are my most, content, uh, most complete man. You're brave, compassionate, kind, a content man. That's, that's your secret, contentment. I'm 24 and I've never known it. I'm forever in pursuit, and I don't know what it is I'm chasing. And now, in one hour's time, I'll be out there again, and I'll raise my eyes, and I'll look down that corridor four feet wide with ten lonely seconds to justify my existence. But will I? But will I? The world we lived in, the world we live in, is short in contentment. Discontent is much more the order of the day. And that's why I hear those words of Harold Abrams and I say, there's a gift that you can embrace that will make a difference. And that gift is this prince of wholeness, the prince of peace. Because that's a gift that he offered. 
Second thing, it will enable us to stop searching for contentment in all the wrong places, and it will secure our standing. Um, one more story. I was working with a pastor over a period of about 13 months, and I asked him this question. I said, what is, would you say is the deepest wounding you've experienced in your life? He had no trouble going there. He was very quickly there, and he began to, through his tears, to tell how as a child he had apparently done something harmful to the family dog. And his father had put a beating on him. And he went to the kitchen to his mom, and he began to cry out the pain that he was feeling, and much more emotional than physical. And, he, and his mother said, you need to get back in there and apologize to your dad. So he went back into the living room, apologized once again to his dad, and his dad didn't even respond to him, didn't acknowledge him, didn't say, that's okay, it's behind us now. Let's, yeah. That's what Neil was longing for. <clears throat> and then we asked the question, what do you think that has, the pain of that in your life has caused? What do you think the price you've paid? For? What, what have you come to believe about yourself? He said, nothing I'll do will ever be right. So here's a 45-year-old man still believing that nothing he'll ever do in life will be right. And he's pastoring a congregation. That's healthy. <clears throat> so what do, you, what do you think that's cost you? And he came back from the, that little assignment of what do you think this has cost you? And he had 18 things on his list. And I said to him, Neil, you missed a couple. I'm such an encourager. You missed a couple. You're not easy to love, and you're not easy to affirm. He said, what do you mean? I said, you send me an email asking me to give you some thoughts or insight, and I know that as soon as you see my return email, you'll say, oh, Chuck's going to think I'm a real screwed up one now. Chuck's going to be really tired of trying to take... And he said, how do you know that? He said, because I've, I've gotten to know you. He said, my wife has told me that all along. And she's been diagnosed as having bipolar disorder. And I always blamed it on that. But you're telling me that's actually true. And the end of the story, just very quickly, is this. Neil came to a service that we were having, and I simply leaned over to Neil at the beginning of the service, and I turned to him and I said, Neil, uh, I just praying one thing, and I trust you'll be praying it, that God will show up and touch that part of your life. <clears throat> At the end of the service, we gave an opportunity for people to be anointed with oil, and he came forward, and he came to the particular place I was standing, not even realizing it was me, and as I, pu I put the oil on his head, he began to sob, and he hugged me, and he said this, you will never believe what just happened. During this service... God showed up, and he took me back to the living room of the home I grew up in. And my dad was sitting there. And as I was remembering the pain of being in that room with my dad, Christ, I noticed Christ sitting on a sofa to the left. And he said to me, Neil, come here. And he wrapped me up, put me on his knee, put his arms around me and said, Neil, you're a very special young man and I have loved you from way back and I'm going to continue to love you because you're very special. And he says he wasn't done because he called my dad over and he put my dad on his other knee and he put his arm around my dad and he said, you are a very special man and I love you. And in that hug, in that moment, there was a healing that came. I tell you, only a prince of wholeness can do that kind of work. And that's why we embrace that gift, because it enables us to secure our real standing, not what something else, somebody else has determined. Or, and it enables us to be set free. It enables us to be set free. Set free to do what? Set free to serve. That's what the outward journey is. I'm whole. I'm strong. I'm in a good place because I've allowed the gift to really settle in in my life. And now I'm free to serve. It was amazing for me to read that John 14. I read that John 14, 27 scripture over and over again, because when Christ knew his time on earth was ending, 
There, he said, I want to give the disciples something that will equip them to do the dawning task that lies ahead of them. And he said, I've only got one gift that's capable of that. And this is the way he said it. I want to give you a gift. It's a gift of peace in mind. It's not the shallow, fragile kind of peace the world offers. It's deeper than that. I want to give you that. Because only that will deliver you to a place of wholeness so that you can engage fully in the world in which I've placed you. Thank you so much for giving me three weeks to share my heart with you. Because I, there was a point in my life when I never embraced the gift. And my life has been radically different because I've allowed that gift to take deeper root in my life over the years since I first met him and embraced him at the age of 19. And my hope for all of you this Christmas is that if you've never allowed that gift to get rooted deep in your life, you'd simply wrap your arms around it because a gift unreceived weighs like a, lies there like a heavy weight. But I know that many of you here this morning have embraced that gift. And I hope there's one thing that's different about this Christmas for you. My prayer would be that this Christmas would be a whole new, deeper level of understanding how significant the gift you have really is. And that you would be encouraged to pass that along in word and deed to others. Let's pray.